and, and what I do at G Adventures. Uh, play a quick video. I mean, the, the elephant in the room right now is the current pandemic that is affecting the entire world, um, the entire global economy and, and travel no less. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't uh, think, talk, learn, and you know, uh, reminisce about the travel that we've been able to enjoy and think about uh, the way that travel can impact the world uh, in a positive way in the future as well. I'll talk a bit about the why behind G Adventures, the reason we exist as an organization, this idea of giving back just by seeing the world. Talk a bit about the how, so what does it look like to be on a G Adventures trip? Uh, and then of course the what is gonna be a little bit more on Galapagos and Peru, and we'll have time for questions throughout as well. Um, so I'll start with the, hello, hi, I am Gary. I'm the G Adventures Global Purpose Specialist, so that the rep for Eastern Ontario, as well as Alberta. Uh, lived in Alberta the last 12 years, uh, moved to Ontario in uh, December of last year, and now I'm back kind of managing both territories. So I grew up in the UK, so this is why I sound like this, but I uh, had the good fortune to travel around quite a lot as kids. My dad uh, worked for an oil and gas company, Shell, so we were moving around a lot as kids, and it, it really gave me that opportunity to see, um, yeah, to, to see how people lived in different parts of the world, to, um, yeah, to see different communities, and I think it really did instill in me this, it, it is a positive thing to be able to go, to see different ways of life, to learn more about yourself in doing so as well. Uh, so I'm extremely passionate about travel, about the change that it can bring both to the people in the destination where you're traveling to and also, you know, the introspective change it can bring to individuals as well. And so in light of uh, kind of that and the, the current global crisis, uh, there is a quick video I wanted to start off with that just talks a little bit about that transformative, transformative power of travel. Travel is the world's greatest teacher. It teaches us courage, compassion, patience, resilience, and most of all, it teaches us that we're all a community. Lessons that are more important than ever before. So just because we can't travel right now, doesn't mean we can't share what we've learned with the world. So text your friends, call your family, video chat with your colleagues, Show your community the courage, the compassion, the patience, the resilience that travel has built inside you. Because now, more than ever, our world deserves more you. So stay home, stay kind, stay connected. So it's just a little message from G Adventures to say that, yeah, these are difficult times. Uh, everybody is experiencing it together, uh, but that it doesn't mean that we can't think more about travel, um, that the, the world will be the same again in the future. It, it isn't changing. In fact, if anything, this crisis, I think, is showing how interconnected we all are as a, as a global community. Um, I mean, if, if you're thinking of traveling in the future, we have changed our terms and conditions. I wanted to put this in at the start rather than leaving it to the end. Uh, we have a book with confidence policy. So if you want to chat with Leah and you, you, you know, inspired to have that trip to look forward to in the future and you want a book for the end of this year, for the start of next year, for the end of next year, for 2022, whenever you feel comfortable getting on a plane and going and seeing the world, it will be there waiting for you. And um, through this presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about community tourism and the positive impact that can have. What we're doing as an organization is increasing the flexibility of our terms and conditions so that if you're booking trips that will depart before the end of this year, then you've got up to 14 days before that trip to make any changes to kind of uh, push it. If the situation hasn't improved to the standard that you want, then you can just um, kind of push that trip to a later date. Uh, and then if you're booking trips for next year, then we're keeping it so that outside of 30 days, you're able to then push that trip to a later date as well. So that's the terms and conditions and stuff over with. I get to talk more about um, kind of the why, the how, and the what of G Adventures. So, you know, for us at G, uh, G Adventures, we're a Canadian company. We're founded by this guy. His name's Bruce Poontip, uh, still operates the organization. And uh, he founded G Adventures on this uh, small idea that travel can change the world, that it can be a force for good, that just by going on vacation and seeing these, you know, it, it, learning more about the people around the world, their culture and how they live, that travel and tourism can save the world. So that it is uh, the greatest mechanism for wealth distribution that the world has seen, that the travel industry takes some of the wealthiest people in the wealthiest countries in the world to visit some of the poorest people in the poorest countries in the world. 
So if that's the case, why can't more of the money that people are spending on travel, why can't that stay in those destinations and lead to positive economic outcomes for the people in those places? So that's, you know, part of our mandate as an organization is to make sure that more of the money you spend with us stays in the hands of the people in that local destination. And that um, it's kind of like shopping local, supporting local businesses, but doing it with our operations all over the world. So I used to have tons of slides that would talk about this. Now we have a metric, the ripple score, and you'll see it uh, on our itineraries in the brochures. And it's just a number out of a hundred that shows what percentage of in-trip costs are staying with local suppliers. We had a third party organization audit our entire supply chain to show us exactly kind of where that money was going. And so, um, yeah, on all of those trips, you'll be able to see, you know, what percentage is staying in local destinations. And at the moment, our average is about 93, 94 as a ripple score for the vast majority of our trips. So that means the vast majority of the money that you're spending with us is going towards local suppliers, local providers of accommodation, of transportation, local guides, um, so that those organizations and people can benefit from having you travel. That's just one part of G for Good. So G for Good is all the stuff that G Adventures does in the background to ensure that just by going on vacation uh, to a place you've always dreamed of traveling to, you are having a positive impact simply by being there. So not only do we have the ripple score that shows the positive economic impacts that we're having, uh, we also have our responsible travel uh, policies as an organization. So ensuring that there are no unintended negative consequences of travelers visiting a place. So our animal welfare policy, no way of interacting with wildlife that could lead to negative outcomes for those animals. No tiger temples, no elephant rides, no dolphin experiences, no shark baiting and diving on G adventures trips. No way of interacting with wildlife that could um, in, impede their freedoms. We also have our, um, our guidelines around working with indigenous communities. I'll talk about the Quechua people and our relationship with that community in the Sacred Valley. We work with a lot of indigenous communities around the world, including the Little Wat and Squamish nations in BC as well. We have trips that run through Canada too. And um, our goal is to ensure that those peoples are able to show their culture and tell their stories in their way that um, they're leading the conversation when it comes to the ways that we and our travelers are interacting with them in those destinations. Uh, and we have our, our child welfare policy as well. So G Adventures was the first international travel company to be certified as child safe. So no way of interacting with youth, especially at risk youth anywhere in the world in ways that could never negatively impact those kids as well. So stuff that we do in the background to make sure that we are a responsible operator, not only uh, economically, but socially and environmentally as well. A lot of this is run by Planetera, which is our nonprofit organization. So Planetera was also founded by Bruce. It uh, helps to provide seed funding to individuals, organizations around the world, um, NGOs, so that they can set up businesses that tap into the tourist economy. And so uh, there's a couple of Planetera projects I'll talk about uh, through the course of this presentation as well. Uh, and if you want more information on g for good on Planetera, talk to Leah. She will have the, that information for you. You can send you those links, planetera.org. Um, it is, is kind of where you go to learn more about our nonprofit organization as well. So um, I feel that that's, you know, that, that's what's turned G Adventures into the world's largest supplier of small group travel. That doing the right thing and doing the profitable thing, these aren't mutually exclusive ideals, that the one has kind of led the other, and that by having a positive impact and by, you know, paying it forward where we can, um, that's led to uh, yeah, us becoming a, a larger and larger organization. Um, and so definitely the two are not mutually exclusive. Um, you know, there's lots of ways that we are hoping that on the other side of this pause, should we put it, uh, the travel industry is able to take stock of its impacts around the world and work more aggressively to mitigate those impacts and uh, start to become a more sustainable industry because um, you know, this is a great opportunity to everybody's at zero, everything has stopped. So, hey, let's look at how things are going. And if we are able to, um, you know, share these tools, encourage more organizations to make sure that uh, they're having positive impacts and, and you just by going and seeing a place are having a positive impact. So that's the reason why this is a company. That's the why behind G Adventures, G for Good, Planet Era, our responsible travel policies, the Ripple Score, all of that stuff. Um, it's what gets me excited uh, about working for this company and, and travel, and it leads to unique experiences when you're on the ground as well. Um, because you know, I tend to find that it's it's not just me that has a real passion for this, um, the, the the yeah the reason for our business being around. 
But I do have to talk about what we actually do as well. And then we'll have time for a few questions. So if you've got questions on projects, Planetera, write them down, let me know. Um, but you know, how do we do what we actually do? I haven't mentioned anything about what it actually looks like to be on a G Adventures trip yet. So what we do at G actually is we run small group trips. So I'm lucky when I talk about small groups, I don't mean a coach of 50 people or a boat of 1,000 people. Uh, I mean a group of usually 10 or 12 uh, like-minded travelers who of all the different places in the world, of all the different destinations, of all the different times of year to visit, you've all chosen to go and visit that place at that same time. Um, our groups usually max at 16, so there's no more than 16 people on those trips. Some of our marine departures are a bit more, but in the vast majority of cases, you're looking at 10 or 12 people to see a destination, and you're not waiting 20 minutes for everybody to get off the bus. You're not filling up that restaurant or that historic site, that museum, when you're there and you're exploring. And you're with your local guide, your CEO, your chief experience officer. They are from that region, uh, and they are showing you their backyard. And it's just a more intimate way of seeing a destination when you're just exploring with those new friends, with your, um, yeah, with your CEO, your guide. And we have travelers from all over the world book with us. So about 15% are from Canada, about the same, uh, our neighbors to the south, our friends in the USA. Uh, a lot of travelers from the Antipodean countries, from Europe, from the UK. So we call this the vacation within a vacation. You're in Peru, you're in Galapagos, you're learning about the people and the place and the history and the culture. But you're also getting to know the Brits and the Kiwis and the Aussies and the Yankees uh, and the, the Danes that are on your trip and kind of learning a bit more about their culture as well as you're traveling around in that small group. And then turns out adventure travel is not just for kids and backpackers. Uh, the vast majority of our travelers are not 18 to 30 something. Uh, it's a, a beautiful pie chart, but I tend to break it down in that, you know, a third of our travelers are, you know, 18 to 30 something. And then two thirds of our travelers are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, increasingly in their 70s. Uh, specifically for our, our National Geographic Journeys itineraries. Uh, we find them very popular as well. Um, but it just means that we talk about like-minded travelers and we talk about psychographics at G, which is actually a word. It is the um, psychological profile of the people who take our trips. That It's not a demographic. It's not the age of a traveler. It is who they are as an individual and how they want to see the world is what drives them to, um, to travel within the different travel styles that we have a, as a company. So, you know, we don't break our trips down by destination. We do it by style of travel. So, uh, you know, every style has the whole world in it. It just depends on how you want to go and see that world. So everything from, yep, yeah, those backpacking, uh, assisted backpacking, 18 to 30 something trips, you know, budget trips uh, for um, travelers who want to stay in hostels. Our classic trips, our National Geographic Journeys trips, you know, hotel, not hostel. Uh, small group experiences, culturally immersive, and um, giving people that balance of included activities and free time. You're in these destinations, you're going to want to go and explore at least a little bit uh, by yourself and have some time to do that. So it is not on the bus, off the bus, on the bus, off the bus. It's not the type of trips we run. There is free time to explore while you're in destination as well. Um, we have local living trips. We've got the wellness trips as well, which we launched uh, last year. So that chance to relax and unwind. Uh, we have family itineraries now as well for travelers as young as eight to go and, and travel in this style too. So I have presentations on all of these, but today I will focus on uh, Marine and Galapagos, uh, as well as a few of the different travel styles available uh, to travel in Peru. Um, before I get into that, are there any questions about um, the why behind the adventures, about Planetera, our projects, the responsible travel policies, what it looks like to be on a trip? Uh, any questions about any of that stuff? If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and chime in, or you can write it in the chat box below. Doesn't look like we have any questions currently in the chat box, so yeah. Fantastic, cool. Yeah, no okay. questions so far. I will dive into uh, our marine travel style and Galapagos cruising in particular. So within our marine travel style, uh, we, we, we're a small group company. So. Um, the largest vessel that we operate is the G-Expedition uh, that travels to Antarctica and also the fjords of Norway in the other side of the year. Uh, it's 130 passengers and 60 crew, but the vast majority of our marine experiences are small group trips. So for the vessels in the Galapagos, the largest ship we have is 16 passengers. Um, and again, something we see, you know, obviously this 
current situation has changed the way that people um, you know, see the way that they will travel in the future. But um, I, I think that you know, we're on the, the right side of this when it comes to our group sizes and um, inherently less risk on a vessel of 16 passengers compared to one of uh, far, far more. Um, just to get you guys kind of introduced to the Galapagos Islands, I have a quick 30 second video as well um, that will talk a little bit about the islands and show you some of the, yeah, the amazing scenery and, and wildlife that you'll be able to see um, when you visit. Just the idea of coming to this location is a life changing experience. It, it gives you memories that you can reflect back on for, for a lifetime. Down to earth, nitty gritty, true experience of the place. This was a moment where I think everybody in our group uh, could look back and, and, and say that this changed our lives. So that's 30 seconds in the Galapagos, the crystal clear blue water, the amazing wildlife in the region. I have had the very good fortune to travel to the region uh, myself a couple of years ago um, in May. And yeah, it's, I, it's one of those things where before I started the G Adventures, you know, I, I didn't even conceive of the idea of being able to travel to this part of the world and, and, and see the wonders um, that are there. The Galapagos Islands themselves are a cluster of um, islands formed over a, uh, a, a geological hotspot. So they're all volcanic islands. Um, you'll learn more about the processes while you're there of how these are created. Um, and it's kind of split up into different regions. So uh, the Western Isles, Fernandinda and Isabella are the old, or they're, they're the youngest because they're closest to the hotspot. So they're still being created. Um, less traveled, especially Fernandina. If you see itineraries that run all the way up the western coast of Isabella and onto Fernandina, this is a place that is uh, far less frequently traveled to purely because um, it takes you a bit of time to get up there. But amazing wildlife on those islands. It's the only place you can find a flightless cormorant if you're looking for a flightless cormorant because they only exist uh, on Fernandina because they are flightless. Um, and so lots to do on these islands. Um, you know, throughout the islands, you've got uh, snorkeling and white sand beaches. On Isabella, you can hike up the Sierra Negro volcano. Hike is a strong word. Uh, you walk up to the caldera and get to see the volcanic um, formation beneath you. And uh, when, yeah, and from there, you can also see kind of the, the volcanic range um, and kind of, yeah, see in action this process of how these islands are being created. The southern islands, uh, Floriana and Espanola, again, packed full of wildlife. We, we do work with the um, people of Florandina, uh, or sorry, Floriana, um, to, we have a, a planetara project in the region. And so uh, very, very few people live on Floriana Island. I think the population is about 150. And so we worked in partnership with the, uh, those people to help them um, you know, create homestays. So our travelers, if you're doing land-based itineraries, will stay on Floriana. Uh, and spend time listening to the stories uh, of the people who live there. And uh, we work with them to help operate uh, when you're hiking on the island or if you're doing kayaking, those kinds of things. Uh, we ensure that we are helping them to build these businesses and tap into the tourist economy. The Central Islands is uh, on our shorter itineraries. You'll find a lot of time is spent here. Uh, Santa Cruz, Santiago, Ribera. It's, it's interesting because they're all very close together, but all of the wildlife on these islands has all um, kind of evolved, you know, individually because they are separated unless they're aquatic animals or they're able to fly. Uh, the giant tortoises, of course, you'll find on most of the islands. On Santa Cruz is where you'll find the Darwin Research Center. Uh, on pretty much any of our trips, you're going to get the chance to go to uh, a, um, a research center to learn about the giant tortoises uh, and how it formed the ideas or, or in, informed Darwin when he was coming up with um, the idea of evolution through natural selection because all of these tortoises are different and all of them uh, have grown up on these, these different islands. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, obviously, you know, the experts there are far better at kind of going through it than I am. Um, but on all of these islands, white sandy beaches, um, you can get extremely close to the animals in Galapagos. When you're in the national park that surrounds all of the islands, um, the, the rule on our part is that you have to stay two meters away from these animals. Nobody tells the animals that. So, you know, you need to be proactive in making sure you're keeping that far back because they will just walk up to you. I had a Galapagos hawk fly directly into my camera lens because we were kind of taking pictures. It was in a low bush and it just flew. I have the video flew right into me. So, um, you know, a, a really great way just to get up close with, with wildlife. 
um, and do so in, in a respectful way while you're there. If you love birds, uh, Genovisa is known as Birders Island, and so that's where you're going to see some of the largest uh, groups of migratory birds, um, lots of frigate birds, uh, as well as you know blue-footed boobies, red-footed boobies. Um, it's a little bit further north. Uh, it is choppier water as well. When you go uh, up towards Genovisa, that's when, if you're doing one of our marine itineraries, I recommend having seasickness pills. Um, but if you uh, really want to see uh, a large diversity of, of different types of bird, then Genovisa is one of the islands you're going to want to see. And then uh, Espanola, the Eastern Islands, um, uh, and San Cristobal, this is where uh, you're going to see Kicker Rock, one of the most uh, iconic um, photographs of the region. You've got Post Office Bay. Um, again, lots of opportunity to be in the water, uh, to be on the land, learning about the fauna and flora of, of these islands as well. Um, there is no bad time to go to the Galapagos Islands. The, the, you know, it's, it's equatorial. And so, you know, sometimes it's slightly colder, sometimes it's slightly warmer, but it's always stuffed full of animals. I mean, the tortoises don't go anywhere because they're there all the time. The blue-footed boobies, also endemic, are not going anywhere. Um, if you want to see certain types of shark, uh, certain types of whale, then yeah, there are certain times of year where those migratory animals will be coming through. But the weather is always fantastic. Um, if you're snorkeling, we provide wetsuits or spring suits, so you don't have to worry about it being cold. I've, uh, the Galapagos is a fantastic place to learn how to snorkel. If you're not sure about being in the water, if you're not a strong swimmer, I've heard stories of travelers learning how to swim in the Galapagos Islands, which is kind of setting the bar right up here. Like you're never going to get a, it beats learning how to swim in a, in a swimming pool, let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's uh, mild weather conditions and um, really there's, there's no bad time to, to go uh, to the region, which talks about seasonality. Uh, the wildlife, I've mentioned a few uh, different types of animal. Obviously, the blue-footed boobies are synonymous with the region. Um, you know, sea lions are everywhere. They're in the water. They're extremely fast moving in the water. They're extremely playful when they're in the water. When they're on the land, they're a little bit more grouchy. And again, you want to be keeping your two meters away. Um, but just, yeah, fantastic animals, great temperament. Uh, the land iguanas, flamingos. I was actually going to put some flamingos behind me. I have a couple of little statues, but I, you know, I, I, I didn't, didn't put them to behind me for, for effect. But there are flamingos on the islands as well. Uh, frigate birds with the big red um, kind of sacks underneath their, their beaks. I've talked about the tortoises. So many different types of wildlife. These are really wildlife focused trips. Um, and if you're doing a land trip or if you're doing a vessel trip, lots of time in the water to, to explore with these animals. We have three different vessels that we operate in the Galapagos. The Reina Silver Voyager is going to be the fanciest of them. We are building it right now. So if you want to go and you want to go in style, then the Rainer is the vessel to go on. It is a catamaran, so it's going to be a little bit more stable. There's less of this that goes on on a catamaran. Uh, most of the rooms have uh, private balconies. We've got a couple of single rooms in there as well for solo travelers. There's a jacuzzi on the back. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the communal spaces will look beautiful. The cabins will look beautiful. At the end of the day at G Adventures, the destination is the destination. The vessels are just a means of being there. Um, the food on board is always fantastic. The accommodation is going to be great. Um, but we want to make sure that you're spending as much time off of the vessel as on the vessel. Of course, if you are um, a little bit tired, you don't want that early morning, uh, you just want to sit and relax on your balcony and take it easy, absolutely, that is, that is no problem. The hard part with that is that you've then got to listen to all the stories of the people who are coming back from doing their snorkeling. Um, and so that can be tricky to deal with, but it, it's, it's your trip. Uh, and so if you want to relax and take it easy, you can do. All of these vessels have public areas. And when you're only on a vessel of 16 people, it's, it's easy to find a quiet place to relax. Um, if you're more interested in each of these, I do have little videos of the insides of each of them as well. Um, the pictures, I hope, will tell a thousand words, though. The Eden is a more cost-effective way of getting to the islands. It's, um, the, the rooms are a little bit smaller because it's not a catamaran. Uh, we do have bunk beds available on these for, as well as twin singles. Um, again, everybody fits in the dining room. The meals are fantastic. The staff are wonderful. Um, you have your certified naturalist guide throwing, showing you through the region. Um, but for, you know, the goal for us is to allow travelers of all different um, price points and budgets to be able to see the islands. And so we've got the Reina, um, but we do have more economical ways of traveling to the region as well. And the Yolita is kind of right in the middle of those two. It's an upgraded vessel. It's cushy. It's comfortable. It's a little bit larger, um, but a little bit more cost competitive than, than going on the brand new Reina, uh, which is being built for us at the moment. 
So lots of different ways of seeing the islands. If you are traveling to and from the Galapagos, we often find that people will pair this with Peru. So they'll do uh, either, you know, Inca Trail or spending a week or two in Peru and then going and visiting the Galapagos Islands or vice versa. Whenever you do that, you're booking back-to-back -back trips. We will cover the cost of your flight from Quito to Lima as well. So the vast majority of our uh, Galapagos trips start and end in Quito. So you've just got to fly to Ecuador. Once you're in Ecuador, we stay at a, a, a beautiful hotel. It's, it's a, a franchise-owned Hilton uh, right in the middle of town. It is, um, it's a great hotel. They have very early morning breakfasts because it's an early morning flight to get you from Quito to the islands. Um, and so if when you come back and you finish that trip and you're in Quito and you want to go down to Lima or vice versa, we'll cover the cost of that, that flight for you as well um, if you want to do them back to back. So before I talk about Machu Picchu and Peru and one of the seven wonders of the world, uh, are there any questions about the Galapagos Islands? So you can type in the chat box, unmute yourself. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if everyone knows how to unmute themselves, but... Um... Will, Leah? Yes, go ahead. We will be ready for the two meters apart for the animals. <laughs> <laughs> We've had lots of practice, right? Yes. <laughs> <doing> that joke. <laughs> Good one. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Leah? Yes. Lorraine. Hi, Lorraine. Do you visit all the islands in the Galapagos if you go on a trip? Like so um, there is a uh, a chart that I usually put on. This is a, a deck that was, was um, that I'm trying out that's created for me. Uh, different vessels will visit different islands and the duration of the trip is going to be the key part of how many islands you get to visit. So uh, I see. if it's an eight day trip, you'll probably do, we'll, we'll have itineraries that'll be uh, center and west or central and east or central and north for the seven, eight, 10 day trips. Um, if it's the, we do have the 21 day complete Galapagos where absolutely you will be visiting all of the islands. Uh, it just takes 21 days to get, to get okay. through the, the national park and, and get the chance to visit all of them. Our ships, they, well, all ships in the Galapagos will work on a rotation. So they'll all have fixed routes that they travel through because it is a national park and it is um, heavily regulated by the, um, by the, the Ministry of Tourism. And so, uh, our vessels will basically do a circuit, and so we'll have people joining to do center and uh, east, and then it'll come back, and then some people will do center and west, and kind of you'll you'll have uh, people changing over through the vessel, and then with the 21 day, yeah, you get to to go through the the entire um, get to go and visit all the islands. So thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we head to Peru? All right, I guess not. Okay. Cool. That means I'm being thorough. Good. And if you have questions, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Leah is your go-to um, uh, for, yeah, for anything that pops into your mind uh, after this presentation. Um, and I will start talking about one of my favorite topics of conversation, which is Peru. Um, so obviously this is what many people think of when they think of Peru. Um, Machu Picchu is one of the seven wonders of the world for good, good reason. It is a, um, an iconic place to visit. We have a number of different itineraries. Well, we have, we have uh, quite a number of different itineraries that move through Peru. Um, something like the Inca Discovery Plus, a classic trip, eight days. This is extremely popular. You start in Lima. We will fly you to Cusco, and that flight is included. Um, always recommend a pre-day in Lima because transferring, like flying from Toronto or from um, usually in the past, I've had to go Calgary or you can go Edmonton to uh, Montreal and down. There's, there's different connections, but they all land at a terrible time. doesn't matter how you get there. They all land at 1 a.m. or midnight. So you probably want a pre-night in Lima. Lima's fantastic. I'll talk more about Lima. Then we fly you into Peru, uh, into Cusco, into the Sacred Valley. You visit um, uh, yeah, some Incan sites, hike or take the train and then come back. So that is a, a short eight-day trip. We have longer 14-day itineraries that will include um, things like the Amazon jungle, Puno, Lake Titicaca, um, and then with the absolute Peru, you have the chance to go down the western coast and see the, the deserts, uh, visit the Nazca Lines, Arequipe, Calca Canyon. There's, there's so much to this part of the world, to this destination, um, that I can talk forever about it. 
the picture in the background of this is Chaka Kirao, which is um, an Incan site very, very similar to Machu Picchu that nobody has ever heard of and nobody goes to because it's not called Machu Picchu and you have to hike to get there. So, um, you know, the more you dig into this destination, the, well, the more Incan gold there is to find while you're there. Um, I'll just because I probably want to keep this to 20 minutes, just talk about kind of the Sacred Valley um, the reason that, you know, the vast majority of people are traveling there and, um, you know, where a lot of the highlights are located. Whenever you're traveling to South America, and this is true of the Galapagos, which I found out the hard way, uh, you do need to have a passport that is valid for six months after the end of your trip. So if you're thinking of traveling in 2020, 2021, 2022, just make sure that your passport is up to date um, because we uh, need that information to be able to book your trip, not just for Inca Trail permits or um, you know, uh, Galapagos National Park permits, but also for, you know, hotels and things like that. We just need passports for everything. So make sure they're up to date. Uh, with Peru, there is a high season and a low season, uh, unlike, um, the, uh, yeah, uh, unlike the Galapagos. So it's really just when is it wet and when is it dry? So uh, it's a bit of a complicated graph, but really the red is the, the uh, max temperatures, the blue is the minimum temperatures, and the important one is the bar graph because that's how much rain there is. So you can see that in May, June, July, August, it, there is very little rain in the Sacred Valley in Peru. And so that is the time that the majority of people will be going. It's also the height of the summer holidays in the north. So it's gonna be more popular. The shoulder season, March, April, September, October, uh, specifically April, September, October is when I tend to recommend because it's gonna be a little bit quieter um, and you're still gonna be relatively dry. It is extremely wet in Peru in January and February and March. So if you're looking to hike, uh, you're going to get wet. So as long as you're okay getting wet, then it is a fantastic time to go because there's less people. Um, it's going to be less busy at Machu Picchu, but uh, you're just going to have to make sure to take your rain gear uh, and make sure that rain gear is, is good. So um, Lima, you will land in Lima. Lima is a, a city of over 9 million people. There is so much to do in Lima. Um, you know, there's great surfing in Lima, uh, which is that top picture. There's the catacombs to visit and learn about kind of um, the Spanish conquest and the Castilians and, and uh, their architecture and, and creating a Spanish dominion in a, another part of the world. We, our hotels are in Mia Flores, uh, which is very close to the Malacan, which is a beautiful pathway that runs along the coastline. And this is the Parc de la Mort with this famous statue with the two people embracing. And the uh, idea is that you have to mimic that statue while you're there. So I was there with a group of travel agents all standing around looking a bit awkward at this statue. And then when I got home and I saw this picture, I saw that there was a couple, of course, in the background who were uh, doing as they were supposed to, which is, um, you know, in, embracing in the park. And then uh, also in Mia Flores, about a 10, 15 minute walk from the hotels that we use, um, there is a, what was described to me as a giant mud pyramid, one of the pre-Incan civilizations um, that was there before the Spanish conquest. Uh, made of these mud bricks. A fascinating afternoon, a couple hours to go and look around. There's almost no shade while you're there, so um, make sure to take your sunscreen, a hat, uh, but so much to do in Lima. Uh, it's not just a, a transit hub to go through. It's one of the culinary capitals of the world. I'll stop talking about Lima because we'll be here all day. Um, from Lima, we fly you into Cusco, and this is where you're going to start to feel the effects of altitude. So altitude is nothing to worry about. It just means you need to slow down. I can't talk this quick when I'm in Peru, which <laughs> I, I learned the hard way as well. Um, but the idea is that uh, Cusco is at over 3000 meters. Um, you do need to slow down and take it easy. The symptoms of, of being in altitude are normally just a shortness of breath. It's like it's hard to catch your breath, uh, headache, sometimes nausea. Um, really just drink water and you'll be fine. You need to stay hydrated. Uh, try not to have too big a meal. Try and get some good, a good night's sleep um, and, and you will be fine. Um, our, our CEOs are trained in first aid, our Inca warriors, our guides. If you're hiking, it is, it is safe to do so there. And your body will adapt very quickly to uh, altitude while you're there. Um, and so Cusco is a beautiful city as well. Uh, I always visit the San Pedro market. That's where I go and buy my coca leaves. The best thing to help with altitude sickness is to do as the locals do and um, go down and buy a big bag of coca leaves for three soles uh, and that will last you the whole time you're there. Um, curl them up into a ball, put them in the corner of your mouth and just, uh, it's like a coca tea drip. You can drink the coca tea as well. Um, but Lima, oh sorry, Cusco, uh, we stay in the center of Cusco and it's just a wonderful place to go and walk around and, and get your bearings. 
From Cusco, we transfer you into the Sacred Valley, which is about an hour, an hour and a half drive, um, you know, through these, through the Andes uh, and through these beautiful fields and, and over the Altiplano uh, to get you down into the Sacred Valley. There you'll visit the Women's Weaving Co-op, one of our Planetera projects, where you learn about the traditional weaving of the Quechua people, the indigenous inhabitants of this part of Peru. Uh, you'll learn about, this is where we get the wool from. So of course there are llamas and alpacas there, you can feed them, um, wonderful animals. You'll learn about, you know, this is how we dye the wool. This is how we um, clean the wool. This is how we spin the wool. And this is how we make it into the beautiful textiles that have been created in this part of the world since the time of the Inca and before. Uh, you'll see behind me, I have a lot of uh, items that I use on a regular basis uh, from the Women's Weaving Co-op and the National Geographic project that we work with as well uh, in Urubamba, um, including, you know, I'll put, I'll put the hat on for everybody's benefit. We live in Canada. It's a cold country. Uh, woolen items uh, are the best thing. I'll talk about a packing list for Inca Trail and hiking. But at the end of the day, um, you know, these items aren't just tourist souvenirs. They are made from traditional materials uh, by the women of the Sacred Valley. And they, have, uh, a, 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 they are purposeful in the fact that they keep you warm when you're back in Canada. Um, so just by going and visiting this community, you're learning about the traditional practices. You're helping to preserve culture. You're providing jobs, employment for the women of this region so that they're not having to travel to Lima and travel to Cusco and travel to cities to get jobs doing something else. They can continue to practice their traditional weaving and pass those, um, uh, that culture and their individual patterns down uh, to their, their, their children and grandchildren. So it's, again, community tourism is all about preserving culture and uh, empowering local people. And this is just one of the many Planetara projects that, um, you know, kind of put into perspective and, and show our travelers how just by going on vacation, you're having a positive impact. It is uh, hungry work learning about the traditional weaving practices. And so after that, on our itineraries, you go and visit the Pawa restaurant, the best meal you will have in Peru, which is saying something because Peru is a, a culinary capital and has more Michelin star restaurants in it, in, in Lima in particular than almost anywhere else in the world. Um, and so to go to this small village, to look through the gardens where they grow a lot of the food, to enjoy the um, local cuisine, the quinoa, the potatoes, um, the lomo saltado, the different meals that are prepared for you for this, this feast while you're traveling through the region for us. Again, one of the highlights of being in the region uh, and an opportunity to support that local culture, that community, uh, those farmers who are local, literally within a few kilometers, providing uh, the, the food uh, for that restaurant for our travelers. Uh, from there, you'll travel to Oleaite Tambo. This is probably where you'll stay. Uh, Oleaite Tambo, the uh, first Incan uh, citadel settlement that you'll visit. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's populated today. So the foreground in this picture is the houses that are there now. The background is going to be um, uh, the, the ancient city of um, Oleaite Tambo. You hike up that little to the to the top there up those terraces um, we stop we have a break we talk and you know we, we get everybody up to the top when you're there you look out back to the other side and you see the Incan storehouses carved into the rock of the mountain on the other side um, and just learn more about yeah the the amazing civilizations that uh, that came before us and then you're going to start to think about potentially how you're going to get to Machu Picchu so on all of our trips there are three ways to get to Machu Picchu you can hike the Inca Trail if we can get you Inca Trail permits. You can hike the Lares Trek or you can take the train. So there is a perfectly good train that will take you to Machu Picchu. If you go to Peru, you don't have to hike. I've taken the train more than I've hiked. It's a beautiful train ride through the mountains. Uh, takes about three, three and a half hours to get from Oleata Tambo up to Aguas Calientes, uh, which is at the base of Machu Picchu Mountain. When you take this option on our trips, it means that instead of spending three, four days hiking, you are spending more time in the Sacred Valley, visiting Morai, visiting Las Salenas, visiting local lakes, spending more time in Cusco, depending on the itinerary. Um, and so there is no bad way to see Peru, and you certainly don't have to hike the Inca Trail or hike to Machu Picchu, um, because the, the region is beautiful. And um, yeah, there's, there's lots of things to do while you're there. All roads will lead to Aguas Calientes, uh, which is that town at the base of Machu Picchu Mountain. Um, if you are hiking, then the Inca Trail, uh, you get off the train at kilometer 82, you hike for four days uh, to get you to Machu Picchu. Um, with the Lares Trek, it's a slightly shorter hike, it's three days. 
uh, you end in Olea de Tambo, and then uh, you take the train to Aguas Calientes. Again, I can talk at length about the differences between these two itineraries, the benefits of each. Um, there's, there's, yeah, there's lots of resources if you have more information. And again, Leah is your go-to uh, to get more information on all this stuff. Um, it's, yeah, it's, there's, there's lots to do. Uh, at G Adventures, we are recognized as the best operator on the Inca Trail, and this is by the Ministry of Tourism in Cusco, and they are the people that you need to impress. Um, it is, we're also the, the largest operator on the Inca Trail, so a third of all the people who hike it, hike it with G Adventures. Um, it's doubly difficult to be the largest and the best. Uh, we're very proud of that fact. Um, we are a trekking company in Peru. This is not our first rodeo when it comes to getting people to that mountain. Uh, our guides, our porters, our cooks, all local people who are uh, extremely proud of their heritage and the opportunity to um, you know, help you get to Machu Picchu in, in any way that you see fit. And if you're hiking, then we make it as, as easy as we can. You do need permits to hike the Inca Trail. Uh, recommend booking a year in advance always. So, uh, you know, if you're looking to hike in 2021, uh, 2022, then, um, you know, setting your date and, and picking that trip means that we are more likely to be able to get you Inca Trail permits. There's 500 every day. And when they're gone, they're gone. And they, they tend to sell out like as soon as they, uh, they go on sale, which is these days in October of the year prior to the hike. Anyway. Lots to talk about with permits. Uh, if you're hiking the Lares Trek, you don't need permits, so it's much easier. Have to talk about packing. I mean, you know, in Alberta, we have a lot of people who hike. In, Can in Canada, you know, we know what campsites look like often. Uh, layers, 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 layers. You know, you want your wool stuff to keep you warm. You want your rain clothes. You want to make sure your rain clothes are waterproof. Uh, you want to make sure you've got actual hiking boots, um, mosquito uh, repellent, sunscreen, hat, scarf, camera, you know, the essentials of any trip, anything that you don't take with you, you can just buy when you're there. It is, it is, <laughs> there's lots of markets in Cusco, in Lima, you can get stuff while you're there. It's just going to cost you a little bit more than in Canada. Um, and I'd recommend if you want to take a small rolly suitcase, that's no problem. And maybe a, like a day bag as well, um, so that you can carry your day gear. We store your big suitcases either in Cusco or in Oleite Tambo, depending on the itinerary. And then you've just got your day bag for when you're hiking. And then uh, you pack your, um, your sleeping mat and your like camp clothes and anything you'll need at the campsite into a duffel bag. And that's what arrives uh, in your tent at the end of each day of hiking as well. So all you've got to carry with you when you're hiking, uh, your water bottle, your reusable uh, water bottle, your snacks potentially, which you'll get there, your waterproofs, your layers, your camera, your extra batteries, your extra memory cards, and uh, you know a sense of adventure, and and that's all you need when you're when you're you're hiking. Less is more. No books. <laughs> you don't need to carry books. Anything that's super heavy, recommend leaving it at home. Um, the Lares Trek I talk more about because people know the Inca Trail. The Lares Trek is beautiful. Um, we use pack animals to carry uh, your gear because it's not within the national park. Absolutely stunning scenery throughout, you're hiking in the high Andes. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, these are your porters when you're hiking the Lares track, um, the llamas, uh, the alpacas, and the, the mules as well. Uh, an opportunity to engage more with the local people when you're hiking Lares because you're not within the national park. There are farms, there's settlements, there's places that you're staying. The campsite on the second day is uh, a planetary project in partnership with a remote community in the middle of nowhere, um, Kakane campsite. Uh, where we work with the indigenous people to ensure that they're benefiting from having travelers walk through this region. So all roads lead to Machu Picchu. Um, with all of our trips, you'll have a guided tour with uh, our CEO, um, with a knowledgeable local guide to take you through the site for a couple of hours. And then also the chance to explore a little bit by yourself as well. Um, there's, yeah, there's lots of rumors about what might happen in the future with the impacts of uh, mass tourism on Machu Picchu. Um, it's definitely getting a little bit of a break at the moment. Um, and the Ministry of Tourism is assessing how they want to move forward with this. Right now, um, you know, you are able to explore relatively freely through Machu Picchu. Um, the hope is that will continue. It could be that it's more restricted in the future. Um, we're looking to preserve this, this, ancient, um, this, this, this ancient citadel. And um, just, yeah, such a wonderful place to spend time. It doesn't matter if it's a cloudy day. It doesn't matter if it's a sunny day. I, I've been at both and um, spectacular opportunities to take amazing photos and, and really learn about the shoulders 
on which we stand of the giants of civilizations gone before us. Um, so yeah, a, a really cool place to see. Then we transfer you back to Cusco, time in Cusco uh, to relax, to unwind. Again, marvel at the beautiful um, 17th century cathedrals that the conquistadors, the Castilians built um, to kind of uh, make their mark on the local population uh, and kind of stamp out the, the traditions and cultures of the Inca. Incredibly interesting uh, place to spend time. Um, and at the start, I mentioned a few of the other places that you can go and see while in Peru. If you've got the time, a lot of our itineraries, like Iconic Peru, will visit the Amazon Jungle Lodge. We'll go down to Puno and Lake Titicaca, learn about the Uros people, the, the, um, uh, the, you know, the culture uh, where they, they built reed, or they do still live on these reed islands in the middle of uh, a gigantic lake, um, the highest populated lake on the face of the planet. So again, at very high altitude in, in Puno. Um, to travel and see a completely different part of Peru, um, to see the, the Amazon jungle, to visit the jungle lodge um, that's uh, <laughs> deep in the heart of the Amazon jungle, a three hour motorized uh, canoe ride um, from Iquitos, uh, kind of in the northeast of Peru. The chance to you know, see something, a totally different uh, climate and fauna and flora to the, the Sacred Valley or uh, the coastal sites of, of Lima. Um, also the opportunity, we do have a riverboat that operates in the Amazon uh, as well, up out of uh, Iquitos as well, um, where you're, you're, you're going, you know, visiting these tiny villages in the middle of the Amazon rainforest on our, our vessel, um, uh, maximum 30 passengers. So there's a lot to see and do in Peru. I would say that the vast majority of people are drawn there by Machu Picchu, by the Sacred Valley, um, and the amazing, you know, learning about the Inca. Uh, but there's, there's so much more to this destination. So, uh, you know, at the end of, of those itineraries, you have that chance to, to, to fly back to Canada. Uh, I've covered tons of information during this presentation. I've mentioned it a couple of times. At G Adventures, we're all about supporting local business, and that starts with supporting a local travel agent. It costs the same to book with a travel agent as it does to book with G Adventures and Leah. Uh, and, and travel agents will provide you with so much value, specifically shown to those travelers over the course of the last few months with the number of people who have been needed to be repatriated, who've learned potentially the hard way about how that insurance conversation is quite important. Um, I don't know anything about insurance. I just talk about destinations and G adventures. This is why I don't book my own travel. I book with a travel agent. I don't cut my own hair. I don't do my own taxes. I don't book my own travel. Um, there are people, professionals, who will do that for you and make sure that you are informed about all of the things that go into this type of trip. Um, and we'll be able to give you guidelines and, and talk about the changing nature of travel um, you know, during this, this current crisis and you know, as we exit it um, you know, in the future as well. So I wanted to make sure I had a big shout out to Leah there. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for giving you, the Gary. opportunity to talk. Uh, to your travelers. And um, yeah, we're all in this together. I've mentioned it a few times, this idea of community tourism, the ability to empower and benefit local people, to put money into the hands of um, the people in that community just by going and visiting. Uh, uh, you know, travel is a cultural exchange. It's not a commodity. It's, it's, it's an opportunity to learn and grow as an individual and also um, for the people in those destinations as well. And uh, I think this, yeah, this current time is is showing us more than ever how it is a pretty small world and we're all in it together. And, um, you know, by sharing and understanding and, and breaking down those barriers between cultures, uh, the better it will be for everybody. So I will stop talking and give you guys the opportunity to ask questions uh, about anything that I've covered. Thank you so much. That is awesome. Okay, so we do have a question. Um, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself as well or type it in the chat box below. I'm sure some have maybe popped into your head. So Terry is wondering what kind of animals are on the trail? So besides um, the alpacas and <laughs> yeah. So within the national park, if you're hiking the Inca trail, then um, after day one, you won't see too many, um, like there, there won't be too many alpacas and llamas because they are um, really herd animals. Uh, so it's during that first day you will, and if you're hiking the, um, the Lara is trekkie well because they're carrying your bags. Uh, but within the national park, lots of birds. Um, so when I was there, there was a, a lot of hummingbirds in the region. Um, obviously birds are, 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 are gonna be less scared off by people. There's obviously a lot of creep crawlies, um, things to keep out of your tent as well. Um, 
there are spectacled bears in Peru. There may be condors as well. I mean, these are animals that are extremely rare. And with the popularity of the trip and the, the number of travelers going through, um, it is relatively rare to see these animals, but there are condors in the Sacred Valley. Um, I have met one of our Inca warriors who had made this trip, you know, uh, literally hundreds of times. And uh, one time saw a spectacled bear come out onto the trail and wait a few minutes and look him directly in the eye and then walk off the other side of the trail. Um, just Google spectacled bear because they're amazing. They're these, they're, it's basically what Paddington bear was, uh, was, just, was, was based off of. They're little mini bears. I think they are of the genus bear. They are actually bears. It's not like a koala bear. That's a different type of animal. Um, they're just very small and they have uh, like a black mask on their faces, but it's, it's not, it's not like a, um, a raccoon. It's, it's smaller than that. And they, yeah, there's a reason they call them spectacle bears. Uh, far more likely to see um, lots of insects and uh, there are little biting mosquito type animals so you want to take your bug spray. Um, really a, a big part of it is I mean beautiful landscapes, um, you know different types of birds and frogs and I, I always recommend if you see something ask your local guide, ask your CEO what is that, what is that tree, what is that bird, what is because it's always great to try and stump them and it's always great when they, you know, again, the, the people that I've had uh, and our guides there are so knowledgeable, they've grown up in the region, they will, they will tell you the, probably the Quechua name for that animal. Um, so a great learning opportunity if you are uh, kind of looking for wildlife. So condors, maybe, uh, take your binoculars uh, for sure if you've got little ones. Um, so I, yeah, I, I was with a, a traveler when we were hiking Lara's and uh, she was a birder and she was stunned by the number of hummingbirds that she saw just in the first day, just going to Pawa restaurant and going to the, um, the women's weaving co-op. She was like, I've seen four different variety species of hummingbird in the last six hours. And I, I'd missed many of those because I wasn't looking out for them. But yeah, um, yeah uh, there is definitely a lot to see while you're there. Okay. Gillen is wondering, um, what is CEO again? <laughs> CEO is Chief Experience Officer. So we have a lot of unique uh, names at G Adventures. I'm not a rep or a business development manager. I'm a global purpose specialist because, uh, well, I help people find their way. Um, but also, uh, yeah, my, I, my, my goal is to help our agency partners to find more passion, purpose, and happiness in their lives. So I'm purpose driven. So I'm a global purpose specialist. Our CEOs, they are chief experience officers. They are the most important people in our organization, which is why we call them CEOs. Bruce is the founder, the owner. He's the honey badger. Like we have lots of names, the captain for Bruce. He's not the CEO because he's not the most important person in the company. He just founded it. The people who are leading our tours, your local guide, the, um, you know, the person who is from that place, who is introducing you to the culture, who is teaching you about the history, who is making sure that, um, you know, if you want to find a, a certain type of food, because, um, you know, you, where is the McDonald's that's, that's there, you know, where, you know, whatever type of food you want, be it street meat or uh, the best Lomo Saltado in town or the best ceviche, you know, they are there to make sure that you're um, getting that local experience. And so we call them chief experience officers for that reason. That's awesome. I love how you guys have special names for everyone. <laughs> and they make sense. Um, Deb is wondering, is English spoken amongst any of the locals? So all of our guides, all of our CEOs will all speak English. Uh, they'll also speak Spanish probably, and also Quechua, um, because that will be their first language because they're, you know, most of them from the Sacred Valley. Um, uh, a lot of, I mean, you, it's very rare. I mean, with tourism being as popular as it is, I think, you know, more and more, uh, it, the local people are picking up at least basic of lots of different languages. Um, but, the vast majority of the people in the Sacred Valley will speak Quechua. Many of them will speak Spanish as well. Uh, if you're in a restaurant in Cusco, chances are your server will speak English. Uh, they will probably also have a smattering of German or Chinese or you know, a few different things. Um, so within Cusco, it, it is relatively prevalent. Within the Sacred Valley, less so because, I mean, people speak Quechua. It's, they've got that, there's, there's a pride to it as well um, where they, they wanna speak their indigenous language. Uh, but then most will also speak Spanish because Spanish is the national language of Peru as well. Um, oh. So uh, it's, it's a French, roundabout way of, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say our French speaking ones on our, our travel talk here tonight, there's a few of them. They would do probably pretty good down there, being that 
Spanish is relatively yeah. kind of close. I, they could probably get around. <laughs> again, for a, an economy that, uh, especially in Cusco and a few other places that is um, you know, heavily geared towards um, travelers and tourism, it, you know, it, it's amazing how many languages uh, people can speak. I mean, I'm always in, just amazed by a lot of our, and it makes me feel bad. I speak English. Like, that's kind of it. I speak a little bit, a very, very, very small amount of French. Um, but um, often they will have, I mean, our, yeah, our CEOs for sure speak at least three, uh, which, is, okay. which, is, which is crazy. But um, if you speak Spanish, then uh, you will probably be able to speak um, yeah, fluent with, the, with a lot of the, the, the local people there as well. Okay. I'm wondering, Gary, um, on a scale of like zero to 10, 10 being the most difficult, yeah. <laughs> how would you rate um, the Inca Trail and the Laris Trail? It's a great question. So the difficulty of, the, of these hikes is the altitude. Um, so uh, we have a little, there's, there's one to five. For G Adventures, it's one to five, one being super easy, five being super difficult. Um, Inca Trail and Lares Trek are both a four out of five. So they are uh, demanding. Most of that is because of the fact you're at altitude, you need to take your time. Um, each day of hiking is anywhere between six and eight hours, um, depending on your pace. If you are, uh, our goal is to always get everybody to the top of that, to, to, the, to, to, to match your picture or to the end of the trail. And so if it takes longer, it'll just take longer. You can go at your own pace. Um, but I definitely say just doing regular training, just doing an evening walk for half an hour, an hour, you know, every day before you go, just getting your body used to being up on its feet. Um, you can't train for altitude really. So it's just a matter of taking your time. Um, and sleeping on the ground. So it is camping. We make it the camping as nice as possible in that your tent is set up, there is hot water there, the coca tea, dinner is on the stove. When you wake up in the morning, uh, you'll hear a tap, 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 and you know, you know, here is your coca tea for the morning and hot water to wash your hands and face in in the morning. So we make it as, as comfortable as we can. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're outside, you're in the elements for, you know, for three or four days. Um, but it's, it's a really a beautiful experience while you're there. And I, I hiked the Lares track. We had a lot of rain the first day and a half. Um, but I mean, put your waterproof poncho on and it, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. So um, it is a lot of uphill. So, you know, when you're, you, I, I had the, the day by day there here, let me see if I can go back and show you the, the altitude increase. Yeah. So specifically for the um, Inca trail, you go, you, yeah, it's, it's a lot of up. Oh. Yeah, I'm just wondering, are you constantly climbing or is, the, is it up and then so for a little Laura, bit of flat and then yeah. up again? <laughs> so the, the first day is usually pretty easy. So day one is going to be, you know, a little bit of an intro day. It's, it's nothing too crazy. There won't be any massive altitude gains. Oh, yeah. Day two can be a little bit harder. So for Inca Trail, day one, um, you know, this is day one in the trail altitude inclination. So it's, it's pretty easy. Day two is Dead Woman's Pass. So day two is by far the most difficult day on Inca Trail because it is up pretty much the whole way. I can easily find pictures of this, the, the, the never ending stairway um, that gets you up and over Dead Woman's Pass. Um, so that second day is a lot of up. And then the only thing harder than going up is going down after you've been going up all day. And so the campsite for the end of day two is just, we don't want you camping at the highest elevation. So you go down a little bit. Um, but then day three, again, it's, it's not, it's, it's undulating, it's climbs and going down and up and down. And then the final day, you're actually hiking down to Machu Picchu, uh, down towards the sun gate. So it is a very short hike on the final day. I guess it's day four. I've missed a day here somewhere. Um, so a, a short final day when you wake up early in the morning from your final campsite. For the Lares trek, the first day is, yeah, it's not difficult. You're walking through little villages. Uh, you've got the Urubamba River running beside you. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's undulating. It's, it's, it's not too challenging. Again, day two is when you're getting up to this peak, you're going up and over the pass. And so um, it is a, a long day. I think, yeah, it took us about eight hours um, for that second day for Lares trek and you know you come out of Kakane and you go straight up a mountain and then you stop at this beautiful tarn this this uh, lake at the top of that rise with um, you know the uh, glacier topped uh, Apu on the which I forget the name of on like to your left 
and then it's kind of undulating um, and then you go up again to get to uh, over over the pass that gets you down the other side um, and then the last day so for Lares track it's an easy day a hard day and a lazy day um, for Inca Trail it's easy day hard day third day lazy day <laughs> Okay. And the best thing about day three on anchor is it's not day two. So, um, okay. It, so if they weren't, if they weren't going to, now that you have your map up there, mm -hmm. if they weren't going to do the hiking and they were just going to take the train in, um, final point is Aquas Cali uh, Calientes. Yeah. So Aquas Calientes is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I was going to say, they don't stay overnight there, right? They take the train back out. So it's just it depends. A, a day visit, is that correct? It depends on the itinerary. If you're hiking the Inca Trail, then you don't stay overnight because you finish your hike, you have your guided tour of Machu Picchu, then you have lunch in Aguas Calientes and go back to Cusco. For all of our other itineraries, yes, you do. Well, for most of them, you do stay at Aguas Calientes. So if you hike the Lares Trek, you'll finish the Lares Trek in Olaya Tatambo. You'll take the train in the afternoon, uh, warm shower, cold beer, good night's sleep, wake up, go to visit Machu Picchu. So often for those who want to hike in the region um, and they are focused on Machu Picchu as uh, you know, wanting to learn and be a highlight, I often recommend Lares Trek because you're going to be relaxed and uh, watered and fed before you wake up the next morning less early than the people hiking in trail to then go and have your guided tour. Um, so one of the benefits of Lares is you're not absolutely worn out from four days of hiking when you arrive at Machu Picchu. Uh, for our Cusco stay itinerary, you get up in the morning, you travel up there, you overnight, and then you go up and visit Machu Picchu in the morning, and then come back to Cusco. Uh, and yeah, with most of our itineraries, you'll spend one night in Aguas Calientes. So most of your luggage will be left at Tholia de Tambo. Uh, you take your day bag, you pack for the next day, uh, where you just, you know, you, you get there in the evening, you do some shopping, you visit uh, the market in Aguas Calientes. There's, there's lots to do in Aguas Calientes. Um, Overnight, wake up, go up to Machu Picchu, come back down, have lunch, go back to Cusco. So most of our itineraries do overnight. Yes, the short answer to the question is yes. Most most itineraries will overnight in Aguas Calientes. Okay, that's nice. All right, and I do know um, G Adventures is usually pretty um, flexible. If if they want to spend another night there, is that possible? So it depends on the itinerary. I mean, often the train times have been booked. The short answer is not really. If we're doing okay. a private group, we might be able to build it in. We do have tailor-made itineraries in Peru. So if you want to build something completely custom, we can do that. Um, but for the vast majority of trips, uh, it's just one night in Aguas Calientes. Now, if you want to spend more time at Machu Picchu, if you want to do two visits, there are itineraries where, you know, We'll get you, if you're doing the Cusco stay itinerary, we'll get you to Machu Picchu, or we'll get you to Aguas Calientes, sorry, in the morning of the day, and then you have the whole day there. So you can actually go up in the afternoon. Um, so we can organize an afternoon trip to Machu Picchu, and then the next day you wake up in the morning and go with the rest of the group. So if you want to go twice, you can. Um, just let us know in advance and kind of, yeah, let me know, and we'll make sure that on the specific itinerary you're looking at that it's possible. But in many cases, it, it is. If you want to visit Machu Picchu twice, you can. Okay. Um, also, Nicole is wondering, what is coca, the coca leaf that you're talking about? Yeah, so coca leaf is the, um, the best, well, okay, I, I'm not a doctor. Uh, this should not be construed as medical advice. If you're worried about altitude sickness, uh, definitely talk to your travel doctor before you go. Um, they may recommend uh, altitude pills, like pills that will help with altitude sickness. I know they do have some side effects, uh, although I haven't taken them because I just chew coca leaves. So coca leaves are, um, when people think coca leaves, often they will think of cocaine because uh, you get, you know, uh, lots and lots and lots of back, hundreds of pounds of coca leaves. Uh, you, you go through a chemical process, it creates cocaine. It is the active ingredient in cocaine. Uh, as it was described to me by my uh, Inca warrior, um, coca leaves are to cocaine as grapes are to wine. So grapes, good for you, healthy, non-addictive, feed them to children, everything is okay. Wine, you know, you go through a chemical process uh, and you get a alcoholic substance that is, um, you know, addictive, often not fed to children, potentially unless you're in France. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a very different thing. With coca leaves, um, they are non-addictive. Uh, you know, there's there's no side effects to chewing them, to the best of my knowledge. Again, speak to your travel doctor. 
Um, and what they do is they just make it easy to live at altitude. Um, they have a slight um, anti, uh, what an antidepressive uh, ingredient into them as well. So they create a slight feeling of happiness. You're just in a bit of a better mood. But what they really do is allow you to breathe at altitude. So the headache that I get when I'm at altitude, it gets rid of that. Uh, it keeps you awake. It's, it's like a coffee. Um, but it, it's interesting because when I, I'm, I always talk about coffee when I talk about cocoa because I drink a lot of coffee. And if you ever try to stop drinking coffee, then you understand how bad coffee is because you get a terrible headache and you're probably grumpy for a few days. And if you go a number of weeks without drinking coffee and then you have a really big cup of coffee, your heart is going to go a mile a minute. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. So uh, with coca leaves, um, you know, it's, it's not addictive. There's no side effects to them. And uh, it, it basically gives you that same kind of um, being able to stay awake. If you're a bit tired after a big meal and you're driving through the Sacred Valley and you want to stay awake, then I just, I just start chewing my coca leaves and it, it gives me a bit of energy to stay awake. Also, if you're hiking at high altitudes, like not being able to catch your breath can be just really frustrating. And again, coca leaves just, just mitigate, they reduce the symptoms for altitude sickness. Wow. So definitely not for everybody, but uh, it's kind of like a green tea and often you'll drink coca tea as well. So just coca leaves with boiling water on them. Um, it's kind of like a minty, well, not minty, it's, but it's, it's a, like a herbal tea flavor to it. Um, and that's often recommended uh, to help with the headache if you get a headache from being at altitude. Everybody, some people suffer from altitude sickness, some people don't. My body hates me when I'm at altitude, I don't know what it is. Um, I, I just, I know that it might, I, I, I'm, I don't do well. Um, and you just don't notice that you get there. But for me, yeah, coca leaves, you just cheap, easy, chew them. Uh, and then when you leave, there's, yeah, there's, there's no downside to it. Okay. If you're if if you're an Olympic athlete, I wouldn't recommend taking them because you will test positive uh, in your drug test. Um, so if you work for the police force, anything like that, if you're drug tested at work, then you know it could be that it will show up. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I it's hmm. bec because it does have that active ingredient in it, but in a trace amount, like uh, yeah, a, a tiny tiny amount. Okay. Um, so it doesn't actually get you. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have like a. Um, yeah, any major effect? It just yeah. it just makes you able to breathe a little bit better. Oh, interesting. Again, I'm pretty sure when my mother-in-law was there, she drank the coca tea. Yeah, and coca tea. Just, the... Yeah, it tastes good. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I don't know if there's any other questions. I don't see any other ones in the chat box, but um, I will. Looks like looks like we're good. All right. Thank you so much, Gary, for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys for your time. Thank you for that coming was... to Peru and Galapagos with me. Um, and yeah, if you've got questions, then uh, reach out to Leah and uh, yeah, hope, hope to see you in those regions when we're able to get back on the road again. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that was very interesting. And I think a lot of us are now inspired to put, um, if it wasn't whole. on your bucket list before, yeah. definitely uh, Peru. Thank and, you for uh, the, the nice visit. Oops. I hear my mom reading, <laughs> reading some of the things. I unmuted everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just in case anyone had any last minute questions, um, I'm going to, I'm going to unmute you. <laughs> oh, there you go. And so oh, we can gee, say goodbye. I just want to say, I just want to I just want to say that the uh, Amazon River cruise was my favorite part of what Terry and I did. It was absolutely amazing. And that neat little, is it Abatista, whatever that neat little yeah. ship was called. That is my favorite cruise ever. And I've been on, uh, I've been on big boat cruises, but I just love that. And the, the cooking, as you said, was just unsurpassed. And everything we did was just memorable. Yeah, awesome. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing that. I know that you had lots of good, um, good to say about it when you got home. So yes. That's great. Okay. Well, and if you have, anyone has any questions, yes, please feel free to email me or um, send me a message on Facebook or text message. I'll be happy to answer them. And if I can, of course, we always have Gary there. Backing us up, um, 
and helping us out. So it's great. Um, thank you so much, Gary, for staying up late with us tonight for all the way from Ontario. We sure appreciate it and hope that you'll all join us next week. Look for your inbox. I'll be sending out another email telling you what's coming up next week. We have two travel talks again planned for that. So I will send it out to you on Sunday night, early Monday morning, I guess. Your time. Have a great rest of your week and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Gary. Thank Take you. Care. Have a good night. Thank you. You too.